I am Daniel Lukies, and welcome to Book 101. Book 101 is all about the books that I read for the last 40 years, and today I have my special guest. He's the author of the Scribe series, no other than Mr. Dylan West. Hey, Daniel. Yes, Mr. Dill, I'm back. Thanks for having me again. Yes, and last, our last episode, we talk about your debut novel, right? That's right. That one is Scribe's Descent. But today, I would like to share with you about the related novella called Emulsipation. Why do you mean related? Is it a prequel of the book or... Ah, it normally goes like that, right? But this time I threw everybody a fast one. Um, so Scribe's Descent takes place in a completely different universe. And the main characters of that story are big story geeks. And their favorite TV show slash novel series is called Emulsipation. So in their universe, this is their cult classic. I brought it into our universe in the form of novellas. So what is the difference of a novella and a novel? A novel is long and a novella is short. And so, so, people have different definitions of just how many words a book has to have to be considered a novel versus a novella. And, and people get really fancy and, and break it down into novelette and short story and flash fiction and all, all that. And Depending on which website you check, they'll all tell you a different word count. <laughs> so emulsification is like the prologue of your... No, it's com a completely different series, but it's one that's quoted a lot in the Scribe series. So think of it this way. It's like their Star Wars. Emulsification will be part of those 15 series that you are inventing or 9 series? Well, these are two different series. One is the Scribe series, and this one is Emulsipation, which has 20 episodes, or at least it will. This is What I published last year was episode one. Oh, okay, so Emulsipation is another series aside from your... Scribe descent. series. You could read all the Emulsipation um, episodes completely in isolation. They're, so in other words, you don't have to read Scribe's Descent to enjoy emulsipation and follow what's going on. And likewise, you don't have to read emulsipation in order to understand Scribe's Descent. It's just that if you do read emulsipation, you will catch those little um, subtle references to it. So in the long run, emulsipation and Scribe series, what's the big difference? So Scribe's Descent is a mix of science fiction and fantasy. Whereas emulsipation is really just fantasy. Now, they, they take place in the same universe. And in the future, I do plan to write other books, possibly in completely different series, that also take place in the scribe verse. Wow, sounds interesting, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> so emulsipation, what's behind the title of your novella? Good question. A lot of people see this long word and they kind of get tripped up. So it really is a portmanteau of two different words. The first one being emancipation, right? Like the freeing of slaves. But instead of emancipation, I changed man with mole. So emulsipation. And the reason for that is the uh, main character named Gidov. And if you look at the book cover, like on my website, you'll, you'll see these characters I'm talking about. Gidov is a teenage boy who, got, who, who jumped off of a slave ship at night in order to escape his captors. And he swam to a, an, what he thought was an island. It's really a raft. I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But he is rescued by a trio of very curious moles who are sapient. They're intelligent. They, they talk with them. And um, these moles help him to rescue other slaves. Hence the, the term emulsipation. Oh, In fact, wow. if you want, I can read the cover, uh, the back blurb, to 
give you the, the fuller description of the book if you'd like. Oh, yes, definitely. Okay, so the headline is No Child Should Be Thrown Into Slavery. All right, so here's the, the blurb. Or made to harvest fruit that's covered in poisonous barbs. After five years of this, Gidov, young Gidov, will do anything to escape. He jumps from a slave ship at night and swims to freedom on a tropical island. A passing ship carries another batch of slaves off to deadly fields, and Gidov determines to set them free. But what can a teenage boy do against a crew of slavers? He needs a squad of trained fighters, but he'll have to settle for a trio of talking moles whose sense of humor is stranger than the islands they've built over the centuries. The classic tale quoted in the novel Scribe's Descent. Wow. That sounds interesting, Mr. Dylan. And according to uh, Parsons family, most to the rescue. They give you five stars. Wow. A long moment balance on a fulcrum made of fear and hope. Can you comment on that? On the whole, the whole um, review? Yes. Okay. Well, like uh, she said there, the moles are a pretty big factor in rescuing other slaves. And the, the line that she quoted there, uh, Fulcrum... Uh, here, made, of, made of fear and hope. Yeah, I, I don't have the, the review in front of me. That one is just a line from the book that um, she found memorable. In fact, uh, there were other people who noticed that one also. Wow. Sounds interesting, Mr. Dalen. So what is the best highlight of emancipation? Hmm. Um, probably the silliness of it. The moles, when, when Gidov meets these three moles, which their names are uh, Sopel, Chlor, and Weeb. And, and I have to go ahead and tell you this. I, I <laughs> named one of the moles Weeb, W-E-E-B, long before I knew about the other meaning of the word somebody pointed out hey you might want to look up that word on urban dictionary so i did and i think it said something like an, an american who is infatuated with japanese culture or something like that and i thought oh okay that's a coincidence uh, but you know it's not a bad <laughs> it's not a bad thing uh, but this mole is not is not that you know there, there is no america or japan <laughs> you know in the scribe in the scribe verse um just happened to be but um, yeah, so these three moles, they are pretty silly. And I think they're very quirky humor in the way they interact with Gidov, you know, where, where they're trying to figure out, you know, why do you humans do this? You know, and, and Gidov is trying to figure out, like, why do you gondola moles do that? And, and that's another point, too. Like, these moles, they're not just regular moles that we know. Um, these are gondola moles. So that, that has a few very important differences. Um, the moles that we know, you can't see their eyes because their, their faces are kind of squinched in over their eyes. Um, oh. the, the other thing is, um, but, but these gondola moles, you can see their eyes. If you look at the book cover, they're, they're actually pretty prominent. Um, and I think they're pretty cute. <laughs> um, <laughs> in fact, I was at the Iconicon this morning uh, tabled up at that event, and I was next to the artist of this book. In fact, at that event last year, that's where I met him, Parker Williams with uh, uh, Caverns and Calicos. He does these really cute paintings of cats. Um, and so when I saw that at last year's Iconicon, I said, ooh, I got to have him to make this book cover illustration. So yeah, it's just Oh, no, I'm going on rabbit trails here. <laughs> but um, anyways, yes. so, oh, the other difference with these moles, um, as, as opposed to the ones we know on Earth, the gondola moles, they also have very uh, sharp teeth and claws. So sharp that they can bore through wood, which becomes pretty important in this story and in this whole series because... The wooden slave ships, well, they're made of wood. They're you know, like the old 16th, 17th century sailing ships, right? Yes. So they can get into these ships. Um, the other difference 
is, well, the moles in your backyard and in mine. They don't talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ones in, in this series do. And they have oh. quite a lot to say, actually. That's Oh, and there's another thing. You asked me what was really the highlight of this book. I guess I have several. One of these moles, her name is Clor. She's the white one, if you're looking at the book cover. Clor is a novelist. She writes novels, and uh, yes, with those, uh, with those clawed fingers of hers. Um, she writes novels, and uh, they, they star moles interacting with humans, uh, kind of like emulsipation. <laughs> and, in, and in emulsipation, she quotes from it. Actually, um, Gidov finds her book, and he reads a chapter from it. Oh, which is pretty wild if you think about it, because um, her book, which these gondola moles are protectorists, they're like Christians in this universe. She, her book that she wrote quotes from the Book of Books, which is the Bible I wrote for protectorism. I, I think I mentioned this in our last podcast. Um, yes. So for, for you listeners, <laughs> some of what I'm saying might be a little unfamiliar, and if you go and listen to um, Mr. Lucas's other podcast, the one on Scribe's Descent, you'll probably catch a little bit more of what we're saying here. But um, so yeah, Clore's book quotes the book of books. Well, Emulsipation quotes Clore's book. And then Scribe's Descent <laughs> quotes <laughs> Emulsipation. So that what's that like four levels of literary reference going on? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> and sounds interesting, Mr. Dylan. And according to Lupus Acer Boss, fun and witty. Being a novella, this is a short read, but it's a fun one with a creative world, interesting characters, witty dialogue, and delightful world play. Wow. If you say creative world, how did you create? emulsification. So this, the planet that this takes place on is Daishan, which you might remember is also the planet that Scribe's Descent takes on, takes place on. And so, uh, in fact, it takes place a thousand years before the events of Scribe's Descent. And that was during the period where this Western continent was still largely unexplored. And so you had these explorers from the Eastern continent sailing over in wooden sailing ships, setting up port cities, establishing Gorazin fields, you know, to harvest these, these deadly fruits. I, I can talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, that was briefly mentioned in, in the cover blurb. Yes. So the, you have these explorers coming over to the, um, the continent of Nicklesia. Right, this is largely unexplored, and um, so all of the geography and all of the world building that I did for Scribe's Descent really directly translated over into emulsification. Except that this takes place a thousand years in the past, and so there's some technologies that don't exist here that did in Scribe's Descent, and some some changes like that. Yes, and let's talk about the main character your novella okay that what would be Gidov. okay well so he grew up in, on the eastern continent of anhasa with family who he thought was doing okay financially <laughs> <laughs> but uh but his dad had debts and um he didn't quite manage to keep up with them one day that little financial trap snapped shut on them and in their culture in their time that meant be getting thrown into debtor's prison, or, or actually, in uh, most cases, slavery. And so because of the, the time period, they've got these new plantations on this new continent that I was telling you about. And what they do with these debtors, and sometimes their family too, in this case, it was Gidov and his dad and his mother and Gidov's cousin, Tamiasel. All four of them get um, chained up, put up on uh, onto these slaving ships, and sent off to work these fields, these plantations. 
And the really big problem is they all get separated, except for Gidoff and his cousin, Tamayasel. They're together on the same ship. His, their parent, uh, well, Gidoff's parents get sailed off to a completely different part of the continent. So they don't even get to see Gidoff's parents anymore. Gidoff has no idea where they are, actually, which may or may not come into play later in the series. I, I guess I have to <laughs> feel that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes but but the question was what is Gidov like right so um he the irony here is he had he had always dreamed of exploring the world and going on adventures his okay. dad worked as a carpenter at a local shipyard so he was helping to build the wooden holes of uh, some of these ships again more oh. irony, right? <laughs> <laughs> so Definitely. his dad, Gidov's dad, was trying to get Gidov to join, to apprentice under him at the shipyard in the hopes of Gidov being able to contribute more to the family uh, pocketbook, so to speak. And now Gidov has this guilt, this crushing guilt, that if he had bothered to listen to his dad and go work at the shipyard, he might have started drawing wages, and he might have prevented his family's financial collapse. Oh, wow. But see, he told his dad he did not want to build ships. He wanted to sail them to go on adventures. Well, guess what? The whole time he's being sailed off to these other continents, he's just kicking himself that, one, he could possibly could have saved his family uh, because he was 15 years old, right? Like, he was an able-bodied young man, right? The oh, other yes. thing is that, uh, you know, now he's going on adventures on the ships he wanted to sail, but, uh, you know, they're not, uh, <laughs> they're not <laughs> the kind of adventure he was looking for, at least until he meets these moles and he lands on their, what he thinks is an island, but it's really a raft that their generations of moles had constructed over time. And now that he's on this, this really cool floating island, so to speak, now he's actually on an adventure, but it's kind of a grim one because he realizes he doesn't want to just enjoy his own freedom. He has to turn around and <laughs> emulsipate <laughs> these other young slaves. They're getting carted off to these very deadly fields. Is it easy for you to name your characters? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes I have to struggle. Okay. But it's, I, I go on a feeling, you know, it, it, the sound of the name has to kind of fit in with the culture they're coming from, or at least my sense of what it is. Is it depends to your mood or what? You well, I build different civilizations for the for the planets that I design, and I have these notes and these ideas of how these cultures are supposed to be, and the kind of sound that each culture's name, you know, their names sound like, to try to keep them distinct from each other. But the thing that I do for all my names, no matter what the culture is, is I try to keep them pronounceable because I don't <laughs> want readers, especially people who are new to fantasy and sci-fi, to see some really bizarre name, you know, that's chock full of X's and J's and Z's to get intimidated and go, whoa, this is weird. You know, this is really weird. <laughs> 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 Definitely. So, Mr. Dylan, before we go on, I want to shout out to the people listening in the United States, especially in the state of Virginia. Of, of course, in Ashburn, I got 62% audience share. Woodbridge, Arlington, Tough Ford, Chantilly. I was just in Chantilly last weekend yes. at the oh. Big Lit Comic Con. So if you guys there at uh, Chantilly, hello, guys. And if you bought one of my books at the Big Lit Comic Con, definitely get reading. And Scribe's Descent, remember to leave a review so I put your name in my video game. Yes, and more books coming, right? Mr. Yeah. Coming. Richmond, of course, Virginia Beach, Springfield, Daleville, Chesapeake. You Chesapeake, that's where I live. Okay. Oh, Chesapeake. you got other people in Chesapeake besides me yeah. on the, <laughs> listening to the podcast. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Suffolk. Right? Suffolk. So, I was there this morning at the Iconicon. Oh, that's the awesome. You're talking to my peeps. <laughs> okay. Rayanoff. Terling. Hopewell. Vienna. Oh, yeah. Vienna in Virginia. Vienna. Yep. 
Woodstock, Warrenton, Stannardsville, Fairfax, Dumfries, Tyson Corner, Manassas, Drake's Bronze, Annandale, McLean, and last but not the least, Powhatan. Oh, thank you, Virginia, for listening to my podcast. This is according to my analytics, people. So thank you for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world, like Mr. Dylan West. Yes, indeed. And you guys that are listening who are close to the Hampton Roads, Virginia area, I heard several of the cities are Chesapeake, Virginia Beach, and um, Suffolk, those three in particular. Um, if you're listening, try to find me at in Portsmouth at the Farmer's Market downtown. Those are usually held between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern. And um, actually, no, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern. And you can find me very easily because I'm the only vendor with a 40-inch monitor and a game controller at, oh, wow. at the table, right, to be able to play the demo of Scribe's Descent. So if you're anywhere near Portsmouth, Virginia, Come on and visit me on a Saturday morning. Yes, people, let's support Mr. Dylan West. <laughs> more, more books to come. Yeah. Oh, and something else exciting. I don't think this was true the last time I did this call with you, uh, Daniel, but my website now has a playable demo of Scribe's Descent that our, your listeners can go to my website and play the game right there in the, the web browser. Oh, wow. For free, right? For free, just it's a demo. It's the first fifteen minutes of the game. Oh, that'd be awesome! Yep, all they got to do it, it won't work for mobile, but if they're using a keyboard and mouse, right? So a desktop or a laptop computer, and they open up dylanwestauthor.com slash demo d e m o. If they go to that page, they will be able to play Scribes to send the video game. Um, now. If they have a USB controller, like a gamepad, that's even better because it's a platformer. So some of that twitchiness is better with a, a controller than with keys and mouse. So tell us how to play the game, Mr. Dylan. Okay, well, you just go to the webpage, dylanwestauthor.com slash demo, and um, you'll see the, the game load right there in the webpage. And there is a button that you click to expand it into full screen, okay? And actually below the game, before you expand it, there's two sets of controls. The one on the left is for um, mouse and keyboard. So it'll tell you like, you know, what to press for jump, how to walk, you know, all that stuff, right? And on the right-hand side, it's got the controls if you're using a game pad. So you probably wanna look over those controls, you know, kinda remember what those are and then go into full screen and just take it for a spin. Yes, let's play, people. Scribe's Descent. So, Mr. Dylan, what are your struggles in writing? Well, these days, it's just carving out time to sit down and revise Scribes of Flame, which is book two of the Scribe series. That's the one that I'm going to be publishing either late next month or possibly in June. Um, just carving out the time to sit down and really hammer through the, the edits that I need to make um, in time to release my books as, as quickly as I want to release them. Mostly because you know I work a, a day job for the, for the Navy as a, a web developer and a cybersecurity analyst. So I do that 40 hours a week. But then on top of that, I've got a family and I table up for these different events like farmers markets and comic conventions and such. So day job and the sales events do eat up most of my time. And I try to just get as much editing done as I possibly can in the time remaining. So do you have timeline for all your series? All right. So um, like I said before, Scribes Book 2, Scribes of Flame, hopefully that goes out next month, maybe June at the latest. And then I want to keep um, going, one, releasing one book a year in the main Scribe series. So Scribe's book three, hopefully that'll come out in summer of 2024. And Scribe's book four in 2025. And then the final book, book five, would be in 2026. You know, I think I 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> and and if I can fit one of the emulsification episodes in each year, that would be wonderful. Um, but I have to see, you know, I, I don't want the, um, the emulsification episodes to cause me to miss my schedule for the main series. So I may end up delaying the rest of the emulsification episodes until after I'm done with the whole main scribe series. And I'm also delaying um, finishing Scribes Descent, the video game, until I'm done with the main Scribe series. I'm only making like small bug fixes here and there. Very small feature adds to the game, kind of as I find pockets of time. But there will come a time when I'm done with the main book series that I could just really focus on the, the video game and you know really crank through that and hopefully get that out to Steam, you know, and to GOG and these other gaming platforms for people to play the entire thing, not just the demo. Why you are delaying the beta game? Why not just publish now and so that the, the book will be more uh, popular? So the reason is the game really takes a lot longer to develop, especially because I'm the only developer. I do all the design, all the art, all the coding. And eventually I will be composing my own music and, and possibly performing it, although I may get someone else to, to actually um, perform the pieces. Um, and for the sound effects, I'll either buy sound effects or I might even foley them myself. It depends. Um, but yeah, because I'm the only developer for what will be a 60-hour Metroidvania title, which is enormous, by the way, um, it'll probably end up taking me five to ten years of my life just to finish the rest of that game. So rather than making my, the fans of the book series wait that long, I figured it would just be faster for me to finish the main book series, and then I can just totally focus on the game for a while. Oh, okay. So one at a time, as uh, as you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can I can only multitask, but so much before it just becomes overwhelming. Yes, definitely. Emotivation. What is the chapter that you have difficulty of writing, man? Hmm. For this book, I don't think that any one chapter was really harder than another. Um, usually chapter one is the hardest one because it's the one that readers really scrutinize the most. But for some reason, chapter one in this book really wasn't as hard as the one for Scribe's Descent. Um, I think maybe it's partly because this book is a lot shorter. Well, this, this uh, novella is just a lot shorter than Scribe's. And that, so that might be it. I probably didn't have to build, do as quite deep of world building for this one as I did for Scribes Descent, because Scribes just has so much other stuff kind of going on in it. Yes. So emulsification, what the flaws? What will be the flaws if there's something, if there's a flaws on it? Oh, okay. Well, um, well, some people see the, the cutesy cover art and they think that it's for little kids. And so they go, oh, no, I'd rather read Scribes because, you know, that one looks more like a young adult book. <laughs> <laughs> so th honestly, that's where, and I have to tell these people, like, look, um, this looks like a middle grade book from the cover because it's got the cute moles and it's got the bright colors. But trust me, I've had most of my readers for this book are uh, adults and they love it. So uh, at that point, I have to just say, hey, try the free sample on my website, you know, and see if you like it. Do you think if you want to uh, change it in the future or revise this book, would you consider to change the web cover? Um, I've been, you know, I was actually thinking of that today. I do kind of like that this gives off the mid-grade vibe to shoppers because there are some families who visit my table and they have kids that are a little younger, maybe a little bit too young for Scribe's Descent. They might be like eight years old, you know, 10 years old. And uh, so they might not be ready for Scribe's, but for Emulsipation, they could probably manage it because the vocabulary and the reading level for Emulsipation is a little bit lower than Scribe's. So I don't know, maybe maybe I just keep, keep the cover art young looking. I, I don't know, I, I have to think about that some more. 
Yes. So which chapter of the novella would you like to revise? Uh, for this one, I don't, I don't know. I would have to go back and really look. I don't think there's really any one chapter I can point at that said, you know, where it jumps out at me that, oh, there's significant weaknesses. And I haven't really heard any of my critique partners or beta readers or normal readers really point out any one chapter. Yes, I think so. And according to Maria, Mariority, uh, exciting and funny yeah, adventure. Wow. What kind of adventure that you put in the novella, Mr. Dillon? Okay, well, like I said earlier, Gidov, he is on the slaving ship. And this ship is about to land on the continent of Meclesia to, to usher these young and old slaves to harvest deadly gorizin fruit um, on the plantation. So I should probably go ahead and tell you a little bit about, more about this gorizin. All right, there's this vast field of a fruit where the inside of the fruit is really tasty and it's used in so many different foods but as a natural defense mechanism these these fruits have developed this very deadly poison inside of its its shell so there's like two shells that wrap around agorazin fruit there's an inner shell and there's an outer shell now the poison is laced in between those two layers okay and the problem is there are these little spikes poking up from the outer shell that if you get pricked by it it injects that poison into your skin and what's happening to these slaves is the ones who are not careful and they end up getting themselves pricked if they get a little bit of poison in them, they get sick and they're in real bad pain for like several days, sometimes weeks. If they get enough of it in them, they die. So all of these slaves riding out on the ship are scared to death because they know about these gores and shells and how deadly the poison is. They're all worried about messing up and getting themselves killed. Wow. And it's so, backbreaking work too because they have to bend over to pick these things up. They don't really have industrial harvesting machines like we do, you know, in modern times. This yes. is still kind of antiquated that, you know, what they're using. So even the gloves, you know, I don't even think their taskmasters really give them gloves. Or if they do, it's like they're not really that sturdy. So even the, the flimsy little gloves they might get. Uh, if they're lucky, uh, really wouldn't protect them against these poisonous barbs. So they're riding the ship. They know that this is going to happen. Gidov, because he's 15 years old, he's able to roam the ship freely without being shackled to the deck. Okay, So he knows that if he goes to this field to harvest this, this year, and if he ends up back, back on the ship to sail off to another port and another plantation, He'll, he'll turn 16 years old at that point. And if, he, if, if that happens, he will be shackled to the deck with the other adults, and he will not be able to escape. Because once he, he knows once he gets on land, there's so many patrolmen watching for escaped slaves that he would never be able to run to freedom. But when he's on the sea, because he is still a minor and he's still able to roam the ship, he decides to jump off the ship at night into the middle of the ocean in the pitch dark to try to swim to freedom. Wow. Sounds interesting, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, yeah. Yes. So emulsification, it's good for a series or a motion picture. Well, you know, um, this I tell people that this is the TV show that Mallory really loves in Scribe's Descent. And then people say, wait, a TV show? Really? And I have to say, well, it's in written format. One day I would love to animate this myself or to hire a team to animate it so that it really becomes a TV show. But anime. Yeah, animated. That's right. Yes, that sounds interesting. And according to Amazon, 86% uh, they give you five stars and 14% four star. 
need to say, wow, Mr. Dylan. <laughs> Thanks. So what are the elements that you put in the story that make your readers glued to it? Um, well, there is always the sense that something bad is about to happen. Um, I can't re really think of any chapter where that's not the case. And, um, and then the moles. The moles are really cute. They're really funny. Um, they, have, they do some pretty interesting wordplay. I don't want to give away too much. But yes. if you read this book, you will see a very peculiar thing that they do with, with, with how they talk with, with each other. Yes. So where did you get those ideas? Uh, when I was writing Scribe's Descent and writing the big series document that, you know, to, to build the whole universe, this was just one part of that universe that, you know, when I'm building out all these different planets and come and writing their histories, right? I spent a lot of time drawing maps of different planets, dreaming up the civilizations that inhabit each landmass, and writing up their genealogies of kings and and presidents and writing up the histories of how these civilizations rose and fell over the, over the millennia. And when I've done all that work, stuff like this comes out of all of that world building. Mm, yes, people. So before we go on, Mr. Dylan, I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast, Food 101, on our third season with Chef Alessandro, one of the executive chef in one of the five-star hotel in downtown Toronto. So please do check Food 101. So Dylan, can we feature one of your favorite author? Gosh, I see. I think I talked about Brandon Sanderson on our last podcast, so I kind of feel like I should talk about a different author this time. Yes. Mm, there's so many of them. Um, maybe I would mention John Scalzi. He's the author of Old Man's War. Oh, that wow. is adult sci-fi. And um, I feel like every page of that book is good. Like there was no page where I felt like I, I, I was starting to lose my interest. So do you think you got that characteristic of writing? Well, I hope so. <laughs> That's really up for the, my readers to decide. Um, but I have heard a lot of good things that people have found my writing to, to keep engagement the whole way through if you describe your writing what is it it's very lean i i try to really polish every sentence so that it's all very smooth easy to follow um i don't think people generally have to stop and reread my sentences to to figure out what's going on because i'm really careful about readability um and I try to use literary devices where it seems appropriate. Things like metaphor, uh, synecdoche, um, analogy, um, polyptotons, metonymy, personification, all these different tools that the Greek orators of um, millennia ago like to use in their speeches. I try to use some of those to lend a little bit of, a little bit of gravitas to the scenes where I feel like it's warranted. Yes. So how do you refrain from being repetitive? Oh, so um, one of my favorite editing tools is called prowritingaid.com. If you go there, it's, it's free. Um, you can take any of your writing, stick it into their web-based tool. And if you use their overused words, it will take that whole chapter or that whole section of text and tell you which words you used too often or phrases. There's also a word echoes feature where it will highlight all of your word repeats. Um, if, if those words I think are like 25 words apart or 50 words apart or less, it'll highlight them. So, you know, um, to try to change some of those words so you're not you know, repeating them. Yes. So, yeah, so on a word level and on a phrase level, I use these tools. But as, as far as higher level repetition, um, I kind of look to see if, if I'm reusing a kind of a, a story element across my book too often, right? Like you don't want to have your main character get 
captured and then rescued by someone more than maybe like one time <laughs> in, in one book. Pro like if that happened twice in the same book, it's probably too often, right? Yes. <laughs> that, that kind of thing. So on a macro level, I take a look at the different elements and say, you know, is this too similar to something I did earlier in this book? Or even like in the book before. I, tr I try not to repeat, you know, even throughout a series too much if I can help it. So are you the writer that you plan first before you go to the deep end? Oh yeah, like I, I build, I do a lot of world building. I do a lot of research, like months and months of research into the sciences and the histories and geography and all that stuff um, to, to make that the world building accurate as, as possible. And then I outline the novel, not to a crazy degree. I, I do like to keep some things loose. Um, besides, for maybe I, I might write a couple of sentences about each chapter. And then, then I sit down and just start writing out the chapter from my outline, but giving myself freedom to kind of ad lib, to do some pantsing, as, as some writers call it, uh, at, in, the ch in each chapter. But I always know like what each chapter is going to be about. That's important to me. And every so often, my, my, I'll deviate from my outline entirely for a chapter or two if I stumble on something that's really cool. And I might even go back and add that to my outline later. Yes. So do you think in the future you will go outside to your uh, comfort zone in writing another genre? Uh, well, so far, it's, I've kept it constrained to science fiction and fantasy. But there are some romance elements in the Scribe series. They only came in a little bit at the end of book one. You'll see a lot more of that in the rest of the series, especially in book two. So there are elements of other genres in my books already. They're just not the main course. But I don't know, would I, would I sit down and like write just a thriller? Maybe. Uh, I don't think that I would ever write a horror. And I certainly wouldn't write erotica. <laughs> <laughs> or anything like that, right? But yeah, you know, I, I try to keep all my stuff really, really clean. I'm a, I'm a Christian author, right? Yes. Um, but, but I, would I write romance? Possibly. Um, my other novel, World of Me, has probably a lot more romance in it than even my Scribe series. That's the one I was telling you about last time about the um, colony of bacteria that lives in the gut of a teenage boy. Oh wow! Yes. Yeah. And you said that you wanted to do another um, another uh, interview with me about World of Me, right? So maybe yes. um, sometime in the near future we can we can do another one of these on World of Me. Watching Doctor uh, what is Doctor House? It's, yes, it's I all, love it, show. Yeah, it's all about organism living in the body, and they become parasite, and it will affect the whole system of the body. Yes, sounds interesting. So I did m six months of research in gastroenterology, immunology, and microbiology um, before I even started outlining that book. Oh, wow. What is the title of the, uh, the book? Mr. That Dale? one's called World of Me. World of Me. Wow. Is it available in Amazon? It is not yet because I still have to finish revising it. However, uh -huh. chap okay. chapter one is up on my author website. So if you want to go check that out, definitely go to my website. Uh, and again, my, my website is dylanwestauthor.com. Can you please invite our listeners to buy your old books? Awesome. So um, I tell everybody, um, if you don't go to my table at these in-person in events and you're just on the internet, um, go to my website first because there is a free sample of Scribes Descent and Emulsipation. So for Scribes, there is the first four chapters. So you can get a really good sampling of my writing style and what that story is about. And if you like it, there is a buy now button that takes you to Amazon where you can buy that in one of three uh, formats. You've got Kindle, um, hardcover, and paperback. And the same is true for Emulsipation. You get a, the, the first few chapters, and a link to that Amazon page as well. Yes, let's support Mr. Dylan West because the books are phenomenal. And another thing is um, I have a newsletter. And so if you go to my website and subscribe to it, you will get several things. One, 
you'll find out when the video game Scribes Descent comes out, as I give those updates every month. And two, you'll find out things like when is Scribes of Flame going to come out? That's book two in the series, and you know, and more more emulsification episodes. I'll let people know. And three, you get the geekiest science research tidbits that go into the making of my books. Yes, geeky people. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I've got several newsletter articles devoted to emulsification where I do intense math calculations to prove that the islands that these moles build out of bobble nuts, really like co really big coconut shells, how they could realistically bear up a whole island that's a um, half kilometer by half kilometer square. That much soil and trees and roots and all that, right? Um, that's floating up. Uh, you know, how many bobble nuts would it take? How much ocean water would that displace? And I go into uh, Archimedes' principle of buoyancy and I do all the calculations. You know, I have a whole newsletter article devoted to that. <laughs> here, here's the thing. If yes. you missed those previous newsletter issues, it's not a problem because I've archived all of those articles on my blog, on the website. So if you go to dylanwestauthor.com slash blog, you'll see all the back issues there. Yes, and one more, Mr. Dylan. So what is your hiring message for those people who want to publish their story? Well, my biggest advice I give everybody is to join scribophile.com. That is a critique exchange group. It's authors critiquing the chapters and short stories of other authors. And you will learn so much if you go and critique other people's writing. And you'll learn a lot if they turn around and critique your writing in exchange. And you do that enough, you will have really polished work to publish instead of you know <laughs> what some indie authors end up doing is they don't they don't get anybody anybody's feedback they just revise it a few times on their own and then they publish it and then you know <laughs> there's all sorts of problems that kind of flew out the door right yes so you, you don't want to be one of those indie authors you want to get plenty of people looking at it so because they're going to see stuff with your work that you never would have seen right problems that you just you were blind to because you're too close to your story right so that's one piece of advice. Another thing I would say is to figure out how marketing works and make up your mind that you're going to be good at it and try to find a way to enjoy selling and marketing your book because it doesn't matter how amazing your book is. If nobody knows about your book, it's just going to not sell. Nothing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm inviting you all people to come on my podcast, Book 101 Review, and let's uh, promote all your books. oh and yeah and these other indie authors like get on podcasts just like yours yes people <laughs> gotta so beat your drum too man <laughs> oh yes <laughs> so mr dylan thank you for your time yes thank you daniel and i look forward to talking with you again possibly in a, another week uh, about another book that i'm writing yes marticon people see you soon <laughs>